welcome everyone who's joining us on this uh, Zoom meeting today. And if folks are in the waiting room, we'll let you in as they uh, come in. Colleen, if you'll make sure that you handle that one for me, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Lynn St. Louis, and I am an estate planning and elder law attorney at ELG Estate Planning here in Washington State. And today what we're gonna be talking about are revocable living trusts and the five biggest mistakes people make when it comes to their revocable living trusts. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those questions in the chat and I will answer your questions at the end uh, today. Also, um, if you uh, stick with us uh, to the end, then we are going to be offering you a complimentary gift as well. So really excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. So let's go ahead and get started. So we're talking about revocable living trusts and the biggest mistakes that are made with that very popular estate planning tool. So I'm going to talk about those five biggest mistakes, but I think what would be really helpful as we get started here is giving you a better understanding of what is a revocable living trust. Now I have to tell you, there are all sorts of different kinds of trusts. Revocable living trusts, they're also called living trust, RLTs sometimes that term is used. Those are the revocable living trusts. That's what we're gonna be talking about. But keep in mind, there are trusts that are called irrevocable trusts. How are those different? Well, just like the name says, an irrevocable trust is a trust that you cannot change, amend, as opposed to a revocable trust. It's revocable, which means uh, that trust can be um, ended, changed. Um, it's revocable. So it's a living trust because it's a trust that you create during your lifetime and it comes into effect during your lifetime contrast that to a testamentary trust that is the kind of trust that is created by your will and it comes into effect upon your death through your will through a probate process there's all sorts of different kinds of trust in addition to that there's uh, special needs trust d4a trust d4c trust there's all sorts there's a different trust medicaid compliant trust uh, Medicaid five-year look back trust. So I just want you to be aware that when you hear the term trust, the next question that you need to ask is, okay, well, what kind of a trust is it? So we're going to be talking about revocable living trust. These are the easiest, most common standard trust in estate planning. And so it's a good place to start and they're very, very popular. Why are they so popular? They're so popular because the whole idea with a revocable living trust is that it allows you to avoid probate upon death. And for a lot of people, that's really important. They do not want their estate to go through probate for a number of reasons. And I know we have all heard horror stories about probates. And for that reason, a lot of people are very interested in having a revocable living trust. So let's talk about a little bit more detail. So I want you to have a good understanding about revocable living trusts, at least in the state of, of Washington, what they do, what they don't do. So then you can understand the mistakes people make. Let's go through a few terms. A revocable living trust is a legal document you sign if you are creating it. And uh, you can create it through an online form, you can create it with the help of a lawyer, but if it's your trust, you're creating it, you're signing the document that says, this is the whatever family trust. Um, typically that's how they're named or your name and trust. So you create it, you are called the grantor or the trust store, they mean the same thing. That means you're the creator of the trust. If you manage the assets that were, are within the trust, you are the trustee of that trust. And if the trust benefits you, uh, you are the beneficiary of the trust. So you can be all of these things wrapped into one when you create your own revocable living trust. So those are the basic terms 
of the trust. And again, any questions anybody has, just feel free to put it in the chat and I'll answer those at the end or as we go, if I'm able to do that. So let's say you've created this revocable living trust now that I've described. Okay, the next step that people get a little bit confused about is, okay, well, I've created the trust. Um, I'm the trustee, I'm the beneficiary. And if you've done things right, which we'll talk about, all of your assets are in the trust. So how is it different having a revocable living trust than not having a revocable living trust? Because nothing feels like it's changed at all. Um, you know, you don't have to file any special tax returns. You still use your social security number when you file your income taxes. Um, really nothing seems to have changed. And so it's for this reason that people don't really realize that the trust has uh, a purpose and, and, and uh, to be effective, all the assets need to be in the trust. Sometimes they forget to do things with regard to the trust and they just don't understand how it works. So if you have a revocable living trust, just like everything that we talk about, if you don't understand it, please reach out to the attorney who drafted it for you or to you know a qualified estate planning attorney to help you understand it. I talked about how people get confused about their trusts and how they operate because, for example, everything is still feels like it was before they had a revocable living trust. Nothing seems to have changed. So this is where some of the confusion comes in about revocable living trust. You may have heard that have this revocable living trust, not just so that it'll avoid probate, but you'll get all these other benefits. You might have heard, oh, you get creditor protections because you have your assets in a trust. That is absolutely false. You get no creditor protections. Remember, it's your assets, you're the beneficiary, you manage them, it's revocable, no creditor protections from any assets that you put into that trust. So that confuses people. Um, you may have heard that having a revocable living trust will help you minimize estate taxes. Estate taxes are what are imposed on estates of a certain level. Uh, for example, in Washington right now, it's 2.193 million. Um, if you're a single person and you have all your assets in a revocable living trust, then on your death, they go somewhere. You have not minimized any estate taxes. However, if you're a couple and you have a revocable living trust and within it, you've included certain tax trusts, then you might be able to minimize uh, estate taxes on the death of the second spouse. Keep in mind that under our tax code, there is never an estate tax imposed when the first spouse dies. So as you can see, this whole idea about minimizing estate taxes and how to do that, that gets a little confusing and complicated too. That's another reason that people don't quite understand how their trust works. One of the benefits of having a revocable living trust is, is that you lose capacity, meaning you're not able to manage your own affairs. The revocable living trust does provide a mechanism, which is the successor trustee, the person who steps in after you, and then the terms of the trust say how these trust assets should be managed and they should be managed for your benefit. So that is a very positive aspect of having a revocable living trust. It does help make sure your assets are managed correctly. Now, a general durable power of attorney provides that same sort of uh, mechanism as well. Outside of a trust, I want you to be aware of that, that a revocable living trust is helpful to manage assets. If you do have a revocable living trust, you will also have a power of attorney as well. You need all of those documents. Sometimes people are worried about financial exploitation. Having a trust may help against that because if you lose capacity, a successor trustee steps in, they're gonna make sure your assets are managed and that you're not gonna be financially exploited because you, if you've lost capacity, are not gonna be in charge of your trust anymore. One last thing I want you to be aware of as to a benefit of trust and why revocable living trusts are popular is that um, for their privacy reasons. 
So I want to talk about that just a little bit and then we're going to get into the mistakes people make. Um, so people like revocable living trusts for the reasons of privacy. So let's think about that. Let's say that you create a revocable living trust, but you use your own name in identifying that trust. So if, let me give an example, let's call it the Barney Rubble Trust. That is not going to hide Barney's identity at all because he used his own name. Sometimes what people do is rather than naming the trust after themselves, they name it after, I don't know, something like, you call it the Mickey Mouse Trust. Probably nobody's gonna call it that for obvious reasons. But if you use a name that's not your name, then that might help with privacy concerns, at least with regard to who owns that property. Uh, you know, the tax records show the name of the, that property is held in the name of the trust. If it's the family's name, it is not protecting their privacy at all. Now, what about when somebody has died and there is a probate? Isn't that, you know, identifying uh, people's assets versus a revocable living trust? And so upon death, having a revocable living trust that doesn't go to probate versus having a will that does go to probate, yes, in fact, will help protect certain privacy concerns. We'll talk about that. Another reason to have a revocable living trust is if you have property in a number of states like California or Ohio or Illinois and Washington and Idaho, it might be a really good idea to put those other real properties into your revocable living trust. Um, that way you're avoiding probate in all of these other states. So there are very good reasons to have a revocable living trust. Now that you think, hey, this is a really good idea, let's have a revocable living trust. What are the mistakes that people make? The number one mistake is not funding the trust. So the trust, the revocable living trust almost feels automatic in a way, but it's not. You see, the key step is implementing this trust, which is putting your assets into the trust. So you have a bank account, you have an investment account, it's in your name or your name and your spouse's name. You have to rename it, retitle it, go to the financial institution, and now put it in the name of your trust, which will likely be your, your name, unless you were creative and you name your trust something differently. That's easy enough, you can do that yourself. How about when it comes to your home or other properties, other real properties? Those assets are by way of a deed. And a deed is something that most people can't do themselves. Um, they might need an attorney or a title company or someone to help them. Um, a deed has to be recorded in the county where the property is. So. If you own a home in Spokane County, for example, and now you have a revocable living trust, there must be a deed that records the new ownership, no longer in your name or your name and your spouse's name, but now in your name and your spouse's name as trustees of this trust you have. So that's one of the biggest mistakes people make is not realizing that there's more work to be done once you fi uh, uh, sign this trust. You actually need to fund it. What else should be put in the trust? What else should be funded into the trust? You know, um, should you put your car in the trust, your RV in the trust, um, a list of personal property in the trust? Um, basically, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the answer might be different if it was an irrevocable trust because a car, an RV, those are the kinds of assets that can cause accidents and generate liability and lawsuits. But recall, this revocable living trust gives you no liability or creditor protections anyway. So putting it in the trust is not going to cause you any harm. Make sure you have ample liability insurance. I would give that advice no matter what. Um, a personal property list. If you want to make sure all your property is going to go where you want it to go upon your death, make a personal property list. Keep that with the trust. Sometimes you'll see revocable living trusts have what's called a Schedule A. That's when you're supposed to list what all the property is in the trust so that upon your death, whomever's stepping in as that successor trustee is going to have some guidance to what should be in the trust. 
Um, people might assume everything you own is in the trust, and that might be a fair assumption, but it's always good to be specific and give guidance as to what is in the trust and make sure you fully fund the trust. Trust won't work like you want it to if you forgot to put your house in it or um, another asset into the trust. So fully fund the trust. And again, the reason for that is so that it'll work like it's supposed to. Now, I did mention about cars and other things that cause liability. And I said, fine, it's okay to put it in the revocable living trust. Keep in mind, if you are talking about an irrevocable trust, different rules apply as to whether you would put a liability causing asset into an irrevocable trust. Typically, you would not do that. And also, you put your house into the revocable living trust, the mortgage company is not going to have a problem with that. Again, if you were talking about an irrevocable trust, the mortgage company might say, no, you can't put your house into an irrevocable trust. That takes away their ability for recourse against the loan. And so it may be that in a house with a mortgage wouldn't go into an irrevocable trust. So whenever you're talking about an irrevocable trust, keep in mind, different rules apply. It's much more complicated. And I would recommend that you get an attorney's guidance if you're dealing with an irrevocable trust. All right, I just said biggest mistake is not funding your trust. Second biggest mistake is assuming you can put everything into your trust um, because certain assets cannot go into your trust. So you might say, well, you said, I just have to put everything in my trust. And now you're telling me I can't put everything into my trust. Yes, that's true. The situation with the state planning and with the tax rules, what you cannot put into your revocable living trust is your 401k, your 403b, your retirement accounts. The IRS rules don't allow you to put those assets into your revocable living trust. Um, there are ways that people create trusts to specifically hold retirement accounts. But again, we are talking about the simple standard revocable living trust. So you cannot put certain assets in and your retirement account might be your biggest asset. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, my revocable living trust um, is has effect over my retirement account. And then you'd be surprised to learn, no, it doesn't. So what do you do then with a retirement account? If you learn, I can't put it into my trust. You have to make sure that your retirement account has on it beneficiary designations and your beneficiary designations on your retirement account likely will pay to people and not to a trust. And so here's a reason why. Remember I mentioned that a lot of the reasons you can't put a retirement account into your revocable living trust is the IRS rules. Well, think of the IRS rules and how they impact your retirement account. If you're age 72, you know you are taking required minimum distributions out of your retirement account because the IRS wants you to take that money out because once you take that money out, then you're gonna be paying taxes on it. And the IRS wants to be paid taxes. Well, when somebody inherits your retirement account from you, they also need to pay taxes. But there's a different uh, period of time over which people need to take out the money from an inherited retirement account, depending on who they are. So for example, if your spouse gets your retirement account, they take out their RMDs over their life expectancy. If your child gets your retirement account, they take it over a 10 year period. That's a more recent rule change um, because of the CARES Act in 2020. If you pay your retirement account to a trust, the general rule or to an estate is that it's a five year period for required minimum distributions. So the retirement account and where it should pay and pays is very um, much based on you know, what, what the level is of the account, how tax sensitive are you to the distributions? How important is it to get a stretch out of the retirement account versus maybe paying it to a trust um, because it's more important to pay it to an asset protection trust. All of that, that was a lot of lingo about your retirement account is a complicated asset. 
you likely will want to get guidance about where it should pay but just keep in mind it will not fund your trust so don't assume that you can put it into your trust similar rules apply for um, your annuities annuities are contracts that you get from financial institutions you may or may not be able to put it into your revocable living trust it depends on the terms of that contract and the financial institution from whom you bought that annuity so you will need to talk to the company to see whether it can be titled in the name of the trust and assuming it can be then what is going to uh, determine where that asset goes when you're gone is it going to go according to the terms of the trust or is it going to go according to the terms of its own beneficiary designation don't make assumptions find out specifically otherwise you might end up with that annuity paying to one person where you thought it might pay to a number of other people your remainder beneficiaries so that is the second biggest mistake people make about the revocable living trust is simply assuming that it uh, all assets can go into that trust and they can't. All right, let's talk about really, I call it the third biggest mistake and it's probably not so much your mistake. If you are the client, it's the mistake of the attorney who drafted it, not pushing you far enough to answer questions or if you did it out online, then yeah, it would be your mistake. And that is that the trust is poorly written. So this trust is gonna control during your lifetime and after your death, because it's gonna say where your assets go. A trust on your death can either kind of just end and all the assets go outright to your beneficiaries, or you can set up your trust to continue for that next person. So sometimes couples will have um, you know, a joint trust. And when the first spouse dies, their assets then will go in and create a new trust within the first trust. And it's called, now it becomes irrevocable. So it'll be for the benefit of the surviving spouse, for example, and the surviving spouse can even be the trustee, but upon the death of the surviving spouse, those assets will go where that first spouse wanted them to go. So that's the reason it's an irrevocable trust the surviving spouse really can't change, change the direction. Revocable living trust will split in half on the death of the first spouse. It will go, the surviving spouse will still have a revocable trust they manage, and the deceased spouses will become an irrevocable trust that the uh, surviving spouse can be the trustee of, typically. Lots of times people don't think through the consequences of the what happens next. And this is what I mean by poorly written trusts. So sometimes what we see is it says, okay, when both of us are gone, it's gonna go down to the kids. And then it might not say, does it go to, if one of the kids dies, does it go to the surviving kids or does it go down to the deceased kids' children, the grandchildren? So you have to think through that. And especially if you're um, not naming family members, but you're naming friends or you're naming somebody else where um, it's not so logical if you'd want to go go to the survivors if somebody dies or down to the kids. You want to say, what happens if this beneficiary does not survive? Does it lapse the gift or what happens? And a lot of times people don't think through the what ifs, especially if they're doing their own online form, because you know it isn't something that you would think about every day. What if this happens? What if that happens? So thinking through in detail. See, one of the things that makes an estate plan good and makes it work is that you don't leave things to chance. You don't leave things ambiguous. You're very clear about what happens if. And so one of the problems with trusts and any other estate planning document is if it isn't drafted with that crystal clarity that leaves an opportunity for people to complain or to litigate or for all sorts of problems. So do make sure that all the what ifs have been drafted in the trust and that we know where assets are gonna go. Along those same lines, think through the what ifs. What if you are the trustee and maybe your spouse is the trustee? Who's the next in line trustee? You always have to anticipate what if 
you or you and your spouse both are in a car accident and neither one of you can act as a trustee. You need to name successor trustees and you want to go at least two, three levels deep beyond yourself. So you want to be able to say, okay, if I can't be the trustee, my spouse can't, then maybe it's my child. If that child can't, and you might say, well, then my child's spouse, well, remember something could happen to both of them, go another level deep. You can always name a professional to be the successor trustee. Just keep in mind that most professional trustees have a minimum um, investment amount that otherwise they won't serve. And typically that's at least 500,000 in liquid assets. So think through all of those details, make sure the trust clearly ref reflects your wishes and doesn't have any ambiguities. Let's move on to the fourth mistake people make about the revocable living trusts. And at the start, I discussed this. People think that their trust protects them. It does not protect you in any way. So if you're driving a car and your car is in the trust or the car is outside of the trust, doesn't matter, you get in an accident, you will be sued. Hopefully you have good liability insurance. That is the first uh, defense. Um, and I also recommend an umbrella policy. That's a million or $2 million excess policy. They're pretty inexpensive uh, for the benefits they provide. But the mistake is assuming, hey, my house is in the trust, my investments are in this revocable living trust. Creditor can't touch them. Wrong. It's as if the trust didn't exist. Why? Because it's your money, you're in charge of it, you're the beneficiary. Um, there is just no wall of defense between you, or I'm sorry, between a creditor and your assets. So you get no creditor or liability protections from the trust. So if somebody says to you, oh, you want a revocable living trust because it will protect you, please ask the question, in what way will it protect me? Remember, the number one reason to have a revocable living trust is so that you avoid probate. If you live in a different jurisdiction um, where the laws are far different than what they are here in Washington or in Idaho, perhaps you can get creditor protection. And I'm not addressing those other jurisdictions. I'm talking about the standard revocable living trusts that you would get from online or from any estate planning firm who is providing your revocable living trust. You are not getting creditor protections. The one exception to that would be that, um, let's say that you're the trustee and you're losing capacity and now you're getting scammed. Um, you know, you're losing ability to manage your own assets. If you've named a successor trustee and if they're familiar with you and they see what's going on, that, you know, you're sending $10,000, you know, to Nigeria or somewhere, then maybe that successor trustee will step in and take the reins away from you. Uh, but that's really the only time that they're gonna, there's going to be any help against financial exploitation is if a successor trustee steps in. And you know, if you're the trustee, you might say, I'm fine, I don't want to step down. So that might not be the best situation either. Oh, sometimes people think that their revocable living trusts are going to protect them against long-term care or nursing home costs. Again, no. Your revocable living trust gives you zero protection from nursing home or other long-term care costs. And that's true even if, you know, you're the surviving spouse and your spouse died and they, through the revocable living trust, there was an irrevocable trust created for you through your revocable living trust. In the state of Washington, it's crystal clear that if you wanna protect the assets for your spouse, when you're gone, the only way you can do that is through a will and not through a revocable living trust. So if your estate plan is based on a revocable living trust type platform, so to speak, um, you're gonna get zero asset protection against long-term care costs. Um, and that might be fine. You know, you have ample assets to withstand 
you know, a long-term care event or you have long-term care insurance, you know, for a lot of people that works fine to have a revocable living trust because they don't care about long-term care costs. But if long-term care costs are something that you worry about or consider or see an attorney who can help you get an estate plan in place that will protect you and your assets from long-term care costs. Your revocable living trust will not do that. Just a little bit of a mention about um, long-term care costs. Um, you know, at ELG Estate Planning, we do help people uh, qualify for Medicaid, protect assets against long-term care costs. Uh, at the start, I talked about, you know, there's irrevocable trusts, there's Medicaid trusts. You know, Medicaid has a five-year look back. Sometimes we create irrevocable trusts to get the assets so that they are protected after five years of creating that trust. Sometimes we do a Medicaid irrevocable trust that protects assets uh, within the five years. Um, most commonly what we do is we prepare a will that has an asset protection trust in it. And upon the death of the first spouse, all the assets of that first spouse are protected against long-term care costs and the surviving spouse. Those assets are there for their benefit, but they don't count in terms of any kind of Medicaid or long-term care eligibility. So if long-term care expenses are a concern, really reach out to an elder law attorney, not just an estate planning attorney, but an elder law attorney, because there's probably a lot of things that you can do um, to help protect um, your assets and make sure that your wishes and goals are gonna be met. Yeah, so that was number four thinking that your revocable living trust protects assets and liabilities. It doesn't. Number five, especially if you're doing your revocable living trust yourself, you might not be thinking about everything else that you need. If you have a revocable living trust, you still need all the other estate planning documents. You still need a will. And you might think, why in the world would I need a will? The whole reason I have the revocable living trust is so that my will doesn't need to be probated. Right. That's the whole reason. But always, even if you get an online form, you likely will get what's called a pour over will. Why is it called pour over will? It's a will. The reason it's called a pour over will is that more often than not, when people have revocable living trust, they have not captured all the assets, assets that should have been put in the trust. So what happens on their death is there is a trust administration and there is a probate. The probate is so that the assets that weren't put in the trust can be captured through the probate process. Probate is your wills filed with the court, the executor is appointed, any assets that aren't in the trust and that aren't otherwise directed to pay will be captured and now put back into your trust. So you've, not only got a trust administration going on, but a probate. The whole reason for the revocable living trust was so that you wouldn't have a probate. Um, so that is a very common situation is that there needs to be a probate plus the trust. So if you have a revocable living trust, you will have a will too, especially if an estate planning lawyer does it for you. They just know that too frequently people need a will as well. Um, don't forget about your very, very important lifetime documents. You need those even if you have a revocable living trust. And those lifetime documents are your durable power of attorney. And that will be a durable power of attorney for finances so that somebody can manage your finances. And you go, why do I need that? I have everything in the trust. Well, a lot of times people don't have things in the trust or remember, we talked about assets that can't go in your trust, your 403B, your 401K. That durable power of attorney then gives that trusted person you've appointed authority to manage those assets if you lose capacity. So you need a durable financial power of attorney. You'll also need a durable power of attorney for healthcare. That's so that person can speak to your doctor to talk to your doctor about your medical care when you're not able to do so by reason of a stroke, accident, et cetera. So I named these as two separate documents, durable power of attorney for finance, durable power of attorney for health. They don't have to be two separate documents. A lot of times people 
put them into one. Um, because of the nature of the work that we do at ELG Estate Planning, helping with um, you know long-term care costs, protecting assets, um, our documents are very robust, they're very comprehensive. So we find that it's easier to have them as two separate. And for another reason, is sometimes you would name, maybe your daughter is gonna be the power of attorney for you for your healthcare, and maybe your son will be for finances and vice versa. So having the two separate documents makes it easier to designate different people. Other lifetime documents, your living will or your healthcare directive. That is where you put in writing that if you are deemed to be at end of life in a permanent vegetative or terminal condition and two physicians have put that in writing in your chart, that's where you say, do you want heroic measures or would you prefer to be given comfort measures only and be allowed to pass? So all of those documents are important to have so a revocable living trust is just one piece of the estate planning puzzle. You need all of those other documents. And keep in mind also that the beneficiary designations, which is probably the most overlooked part of an estate plan, because it's really not an estate planning document, but you need help and guidance on how should you set up your beneficiary designation. Should you say that the IRA pays to your trust or to your spouse and the alternate to your kids? Should you say your um, IRA pays to an asset protection trust or a different type of trust? So a beneficiary designation is often overlooked. And sometimes people think, well, my trust will manage it. Not necessarily. Um, you might may or may not know this, but uh, retirement plans, especially like 403Bs, 401ks, they'll have their own set of default rules unless somebody consents to something different. So for example, it might say that it pays to your spouse, maybe your spouse, you just married them six months ago. They'll get all of your assets, your kids will get none unless they consent to not receiving the assets, even if it's your separate property. Uh, so you have to be aware that retirement accounts and beneficiary designations are a critical part of your estate plan and just having a revocable living trust isn't going to handle that piece of it so don't overlook the other really important estate planning documents you need and that is the fifth biggest mistake that people have is overlooking those documents so kind of to wrap it up here having a revocable living trust can be a really good idea, but it's not as simple as you think. You need to have all those other documents. You need to have guidance from an estate planning and elder law attorney. It requires a lot more upfront work, but if you do it right, then upon your death, things may be easier for those folks that you leave behind. So it might be an excellent idea to have a revocable living trust. But if you do, just make sure you do it right. Um, otherwise, you're gonna create more work than if you didn't even have that revocable living trust. Also, a revocable living trust might be a terrible idea. Why is that? At Elder Law Group, we help people protect their assets and get the care and the state benefits that they qualify for. Oftentimes, how that's done is through an estate planning uh, platform, so to speak, that's based on a will with an asset protection trust in it. Through that, we're able to protect one half to 100% of a couple's assets when the first spouse dies. And we can't do that if we're using a revocable living trust. We can only do that through a will. That's what the state of Washington requires. And what that means is that there is going to need to be a probate. So, you know, when people say, well, probate is terrible, it should be avoided. It's like, that's a little too simple. Let's talk more about what are your goals? What are your concerns? What are you trying to achieve? Avoiding probate might be the right thing for your situation, or it might be a really bad idea because maybe you do have to go through a probate. And yes, probates cost money, absolutely. But if you can protect 50% to 100% 
of the assets, then that might be well worth it. People don't like to pay lawyers fees. Obviously, nobody likes to pay for something if they don't see the benefit. So in order to see the benefit, you know, reach out to an attorney and meet with them and go over your situation. Because all of us, we don't know what we don't know. That's why we seek out the help from experts. Um, one thing about revocable living trusts, if you're trying to avoid you know, attorney's fees on your death, do keep in mind that part of that might be whoever you set in that role of administering your trust, hopefully they'll follow your wishes, hopefully they'll do it right, but they might not know what they might not know and they might not do things as you had, you know, set it up because they didn't seek a lawyer. Um, you know, your estate, you worked hard for it, you're trying to do what is the right thing and sometimes it's hard to know what the right thing is unless you get that legal guidance. So, um, I want to take a look at the questions here and then we're going to wrap up a uh, really good question. Are inheritance rules the same for IRAs and Roths? No, they're not. The reason for that is Roth IRAs, Roth accounts, you paid the taxes before you put the money into that retirement account. So those are different rules than for a typical retirement account where you have not yet paid the taxes on that. So Ross have much greater uh, flexibility. Um, there's not RMDs, etc. So I'm not seeing any other questions. So I said that if you stuck with us to the end, um, that we are going to offer you a free gift. And what that is, is we will send you a certificate for a complimentary consultation. Um, we know that people have questions and we want to be able to help you answer those questions. So we'll reach out and see if you um, qualify. So if you want to take advantage of that complimentary uh, certificate for a consultation, I encourage you to do so. Typically, we do charge a consultation fee of 375, but we're going to waive that uh, for you.